I'm Garrett Diamore. I'm the director of engineering for Nexena uh, Systems uh, for plat and I should actually say platform software. So um, the Nexena products we have we have really uh, a couple, but there's the uh, Nexena Store is what most of us are, are concerned with, and there's the Community Edition and the Enterprise Edition. But uh, it's really still the same product. We also have Nexena Core platform, but both of these products, especially Nexen, well, in particular Nexena. Um, uh, Nixena Store is uh, divided essentially in its engineering and in its code base into two halves. Uh, the first half of this is the uh, platform, what I call the platform software or the underlying operating system. Um, prior to my arrival, it was called, the Nixenta called it the kernel, but they really meant the kernel plus libc plus a whole bunch of utilities and some packaging and, <laughs> but all this stuff is open source. Uh, the other side is the appliance software, which is the uh, management software, analytics, and so forth that you've seen in all the pretty screenshots. Um, I am talking about the open source software that's the platform software um, here, so you won't see any nice pretty screenshots because, frankly, text screens are pretty boring. So we call this bottom piece, and, and, and this name, I, I've been told, has been deprecated, but I, I'm reviving it. Uh, this is kind of my prerogative. Uh, to mean the underlying operating system, Nexenta, Nexenta OS. Um, you know, this is, from my point of view, this is what was, would be, for those of you who are familiar with uh, Solaris technology, is, is OS Net or ON. Um, it's the operating system base for our, for our products. Um, it's derived from Open Solaris which you can actually say also goes back to Solaris, uh, at least the Solaris 2.x stuff. It's about, it's about 20 years. I haven't actually done the math, but I kind of remember using this stuff yeah, pretty, pretty long time ago. So SVR 4.2 derived, and um, you know, for the most part, uh, I should have put it in parentheses here, it's open source. Uh, there's, there's still some closed pieces. Uh, actually, there's more closed pieces in there than I would like, uh, and there's going to be fewer of them in the future. Um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that you prob may have heard of. Uh, certainly, you all know about ZFS. Hopefully, that's why a lot of you are here. Uh, Comstar well, related or, or iSCSI target um, support. Well, Comstar is more than just iSCSI target. It's all the targets, fiber channel, fiber channel over Ethernet. Um, uh, and I can talk a little bit about other, others that are coming. Uh, D-Trace, CrossPro. Um, uh, D-Trace is, is our, uh, it's really the, the, the thing that allows us to probe into the system and, and know more about it. And uh, CrossPro is some ne are some networking innovations. These networking innovations in CrossPro, we don't actually use directly in Nixenis products in, at the moment. Um, those, those are potential future directions uh, for, for the appliance guys really to look at. But if you're uh, a networking wizard, um, you can yet take advantage of these um, by, by configuring things at the shell. So sort of a, a little bit of a, a, little bit of a uh, timeline here, a roadmap. I hate calling these things a roadmap. Um, I, I hate roadmap presentations, even though this is kind of, that's kind of what this is about. Um, so the previous major release was 2.0. We had I didn't put 2.2 in there and all that other stuff. But it was a previous major release based on I think build 104, um, this, which by open source standards is pretty ancient. Um, I wasn't around at Nexenta for this stuff, um, and so I don't really have much knowledge of what is and isn't in 2.0. Although you can go back and look at what if you can remember. Trying to remember what was in build 104 of open source seems like so long ago. So 3.0 um, is the current major release. There's a few of these minor updates that have happened. Um, so these version numbers actually are, are probably more indicative of the Nixenta store version numbers. Um, there's been some confusion around version numbers in, with our releases in the past, something for which I apologize, uh, which is going to get far better starting with our next um, minor release, 3.1. So 3.04 is the very latest update. I had actually expected it to be released, but um, we're dealing with there was a, an exceptional case that was found in QA, and we don't want to release it until we figure out whether the problem is in the code or in our QA methodology or something else. So, uh, not a, not a critical issue, but uh, definitely one that we can't ship with if the test reports are accurate. So, um, I've got a couple engineers uh, uh, figuring that stuff out now. Um, the um, actually the problem with well, I don't want to say more about the, what the problem is. So the 3.1 forthcoming feature update 
this is very rough, no promises here, but this is what we currently believe. It's early calendar year 2011, so early next year. Um, you know, I think you've been talking about April, March, April. Uh, there's there's a lot of factors that still have to come into play, particularly in QA. And um, when, when problems are found, you never know exactly how long it's going to take. So I don't want to make promises and then have you come back and, and tell me, hey, but you said this is going to be released already. So, but yeah, for uh, well, I will say this is that we are in a code freeze for the kernel for 3.1. Um, so the only things that we're doing in 3.1 in the kernel from this point forward that are not already integrated are, um, for the most part, bug fixes. Actually, that's not entirely true. There's some stuff going on in the SIFS arena that is probably crossing the boundary between what's a, what's a feature freeze and, and uh, what's a feature and what's a bug. But for the most part, the code's frozen. Um, the main work that, the, that my team is working on right now and is in our current heavy development is the 4.0. Uh, which will be the next major release, and that's probably about a year out. I hope to bring it in in less than a year, but um, it's a major, major update, and we'll talk a lot. I'm going to talk more about each one of these things except 2.0. You won't hear me say anything else about 2.0 for this presentation, so, uh, or 2.x, because it's not new. Um, so the new features here. So this is just sort of a, a quick, quick menu. We're going to go over them all in, in detail. Um, I'm just going to go ahead and move to the next slide. Um, but for those of you looking online, you can go back and ponder this slide at your leisure. So we're now talking about what's going on for th for um, 3.1. Uh, I'm not really going to. Uh, oh, pardon me. For 3.0, I'm sorry. So our base kernel version went up from one, from build 104 to build 134, and uh, it was which was the last public. Uh, semi-stable uh, build from, from Oracle. Um, in fact, it might have been released as a sun back then. I can't remember how long ago that was. I think it was Oracle. Um, there's a boatload of fixes and enhancements. So I'm not going to talk about all the fixes and enhancements. I'm going to talk about the ones that are most relevant to, uh, that I believe at least, are most relevant to us uh, as uh, consumers of Nixena's product and consumers of open storage. Um, in addition to, so most of these fixes and enhancements came from basically from Oracle directly. Basically, we took the Oracle's code base and just used it. Um, we at Nixena have done a lot, have added many, many, many fixes. Um, and, and some of which were, many of which were actually pulled from just later updates because Build 134, uh, the last code snapshot that, that Oracle dropped was about five days after build 147 closed. I think it was five days. So there's a lot of, there were a lot of code fixes that we were able to see. The, code, the fixes are there in the code. Some of them our customers were hitting. Some of them we were hitting in the lab. We've pulled back a lot of those. In addition, there's changes that we have made um, uh, independently of, uh, independently of Oracle. And uh, those are in here as well. So. So the first kind of big feature that for 3.0 for 3 is sort of the big, uh, uh, I think I heard uh, Richard Ellen call it the $2.1 billion feature, um, was, was ZFS deduplication. So, uh, you know, I caught it, I have it here labeled the new hotness. It's, I, in my opinion, it is, it is heavily hyped, but very often um, uh, misused. Uh, there's some issue, there are some applications for it where it's incredibly powerful, but there's also some significant drawbacks that you need to be aware of. The main key thing here is, and I'm not going to delve too deeply because I only have half an hour, is the point of this is to reduce data redundancy. Um, so you reduce, you reduce your data storage requirements by reducing the number of copies. If you've got 100 VMs, each with its own copy of a copy of the of, a, of an operating system, where all, or an operating system with maybe multiple versions of the operating system, but 90% of the code of the files on there are identical. Uh, not just files, but blocks are identical because it's a block level algorithm. We just um, we only store one, or actually it's more than one uh, in many cases if you have, uh, if you use what are called dedupe ditto blocks. Um, 
And it's a runtime, the deduplication happens at runtime. Uh, and, and the duplication is performed across multiple file systems within a pool. So uh, each, if you have multi, if you have a one file ZFS file system per VM as an example, um, they will, as long as they're on the same pool, you'll get the deduplication benefit. So here's some typical scenarios. Um, I, one of the, actually, the, one, the, the killer feature for, for Sun when this stuff was being developed was build servers. So you got a one, one comp compile server uh, with uh, maybe uh, 20 or 100 developers, and each one of whom's got maybe four or five copies of the OS with you know, maybe 20 lines of change out of, 20, out of 15 million lines of code. Um, you know, there's a, a lot of files that are pretty much identical. And uh, in the storage requirements there get uh, fairly massive when you talk about uh, all of these works, build workspaces. And there's, you know, you, you know, after a build, you might have uh, several gigabytes of, of space consumption within a workspace. Um, so the other, so, that, so that's one application. The other application here, that this is one that's probably more, more relevant within this audience is virtualization. So I already touched on this. You've got multiple VMs with the same OS. Um, it's only store one copy. Well, it's, and as I said, it's actually more than one copy um, when you use dedupe ditto, uh, but it's not. But it's not a hundred copies if you have a hundred VMs. So there are uh, there are some really good key examples when I don't when I would discourage the use of dedupe. Um, if you only have one or two copies of your data. Well, one copy obviously you're not going to see any dedupe benefit. If you have two copies of your data. Well, if you use dedupe you, and you don't have dedupe ditto turned on, you're implicitly reducing the redundancy of your data. So, and you're not getting much benefit. Stored disk is cheap after all. I don't think there's, I, I think I would discourage you from using dedupe if you only have two copies of your data. Uh, if you're memory constrained, now this is really key. So, this number 2.4 gigabyte per terabyte, that's sort of the best case because that's based on 128K block size. Um, if, you, if your average block size is smaller, it's going to be significantly higher. And this number varies based on which version of the, uh, I, I think this was, I based this on 300 bytes per, uh, uh, per DDT entry, the DDoop table entry. Um, I don't want to break down how that came in, it came about, that those numbers came about too closely. Uh, Richard Elling's talk, I think, covered that in gory detail. Um, and there's lots and lots of information about this online. But the key thing is, if you're going to use dedupe, uh, you almost can't throw enough memory at this problem. Um, if you're doing data set deletes, dedupe deletion is very, 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 very time consuming. Um, in fact, I would say to plan on not doing uh, file set deletion if you're using dedo. Um, or at least plan on if you're going to do it, uh, do it on a Friday night and plan on nobody being able to use the system until the following Friday night. <laughs> uh, maybe not that, that extreme, but at least you want to at least allow, allocate um, a good weekend of, of solid data if you have significant data. The more files you have, the more data you have, that's the, the worse the dedo is going to be. The, the deletion of the dedo. Um, so, because most of what's happening are small metadata random random writes, yes. Uh, 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 well, a separate log device. Uh, I have, which is going to shoot me if I actually call it, make the mistake and call that a zil too. <laughs> so I've been trying to train myself not to make that mistake. But a separate log device um, or, or the logzilla can be a, be a, a significant help here. But, it's, but, there's, but, there's, but the writes are scattered all over the place. And it's so many of them that even the log, separate log device by itself doesn't, um, it doesn't solve the problem. It, it helps. Um, the other place not to use DDoP is because there's on disk format changes. If you need to go back to a version, an earlier version, if you need backwards compatibility to uh, the 2.x tree, you don't, what you don't want to do is take all your data and say you're going to do a test deployment to try 3.x. And your backup plan is that you can always go back to 2.x. If you turn on DDoP, you can't do that. It's a one-way one street. So. 